and thank you for joining this webinar entitled Technology and Criminal Record Clearance. My name is Alex Lussman, and I'm a policy analyst for the Criminal Records Project at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. The Council of State Governments Justice Center provides practical, nonpartisan, research-driven strategies and tools to increase public safety and strengthen communities. Before getting started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping points about how the webinar works. If you encounter any technical problems, including audio problems, please call WebEx Technical Support at 866-229-3239. That number again, 866-229-3239. This information is also located in the chat box on your screen. Please understand that there may be some individual technical problems we cannot resolve. For this reason, we are recording this webinar and will post it on our website at cleanslateclearinghouse.org, where it will remain accessible. At any time during this webinar, you can ask a question by typing it into the Q&A box on your screen. This includes both technical and content-related questions. We will reply to technical questions as we go. For content-related questions, we will keep a running list and the presenters will address them at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. Today's presenters are Michael Hollander, Supervising Attorney at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia, Matthew Steubenberg, Associate Director of Legal Technology in the Access to Justice Lab at Harvard Law School, and Jason Taché, Legal Affairs Writer for the American Bar Association and Adjunct Professor at Georgetown University Law Center. We will be hearing from them shortly. This webinar is part of the Clean Slate Clearinghouse, a project funded by the U.S. Department of Labor and the U.S. Department of Justice. The Clean Slate Clearinghouse was created to support juvenile record and adult criminal record clearance around the country by, first, providing up-to-date information on record clearance as well as contact information for legal service providers in all U.S. states and territories. Second, developing tools and resources for legal service providers currently doing record clearance work or those who want to expand their record clearance services. And third, providing information to compare record clearance policies across jurisdictions and to learn about best practices. The site was designed to serve three target audiences, people with criminal records who are seeking to have their records cleared, legal service providers who offer record clearance services, and policymakers and stakeholders who want to compare record clearance policies across the country. The site is also useful for reentry and workforce service providers who can connect people to services, indigent defense attorneys and pro bono attorneys who are interested in starting or expanding a record clearance practice, and researchers and journalists who want to compare trends in record clearance legislation across the country. The primary goals of the Clean Slate Clearinghouse are to provide accessible, up-to-date information for record clearance policies across the country and to increase the capacity of legal service providers while creating a community of practice for those doing record clearance work. We encourage you to visit the website and sign up for our newsletter to stay updated on news, events, and webinars such as this one. Now, I'll turn it over to our first presenter, Jason Taché. Thank you and I'm going to go in the right order. Uh, my job today is to give you a sense of what these projects are and what the ecosystem looks like broadly, and then I'll hand it off to uh, Matthew and Michael, who have really been at the vanguard of this issue, both legally and technically, uh, for a number of years. So in the broadest sense possible, expungement technologies are meant to streamline or make more efficient some aspect 
of the expungement process. And this has meant that stakeholders as diverse as courts, defender's office, uh, system advocates, legal aid, as well as now prosecutors have taken advantage of these technologies to go ahead and improve uh, access and filing around um, expungement and expunction policies um, around the country. So uh, I'll be giving this uh, table setting view followed by a look at Maryland and Pennsylvania and then ultimately uh, your questions at the end. So very broadly, uh, expungement applications can come in a handful uh, of different forms, uh, usually based on limitations within the jurisdiction that they're trying to be developed in. Uh, these limitations include issues like funding, uh, technical capacity, uh, as well as uh, legal limitations and, and data limitations as well, which I'll talk about a little bit during my uh, section. So the three issues though currently up on your screen, um, the, the first kind of dichotomy that you see in these projects uh, is around public facing uh, and client facing or attorney facing applications. And that means more or less what it says is that the tools are either built for uh, the public or the individual who needs their uh, record cleared uh, as the end user or the attorney that's trying to fill out uh, these forms on behalf of a client. Um, and that, depending on which approach is taken, then different features will be added as a uh, different intent is meant to come out of it. Uh, under the, client, uh, the public client version of the applications, there's kind of a couple different subcategories that I've been able to see uh, looking at this issue. Um, and most what I talk about here, if people want uh, to look up a referral, uh, is in a, a report I wrote a couple of years ago for an organization called SimLab, and you can find it at simlab.org uh, to dive deeper into what I'm going to cover kind of superficially today. But those public client uh, versions, the, the first main version is either an intake or referral form used by either an advocacy organization or a, a legal organization looking to get people uh, to access expungement services. Uh, you also see them being used as merely education tools. This has happened in uh, the Mississippi uh, Supreme Court Access to Justice Commission, for example, commissioned uh, an expungement app to help educate those helping their expungement clinics so they understood the statutes better uh, when they showed up at the physical clinic. Um, and then last, and this was something that came out of Chicago, was this idea of breaking the window, the idea that the expungement process is onerous and time consuming, but if they made it more efficient by improving public access uh, through one of these tools, then they could overload the system and force uh, the system to think about how it itself could be more efficient. Um, and then looking at the attorney facing tools, these are used internally, they tend to be used to affect an existing workflow, which is really important in regards to uh, efficacy of these projects. The public facing uh, projects tend to not have the same amount of impact by number of expungements filed as the attorney facing tools, uh, which uh, you'll hear about a little bit more uh, from our other tool speakers or, or our other two speakers. But uh, regardless of who the uh, tool is moved, uh, used by, there are two basic uh, versions. One is a more manual version where people will answer binary questions uh, about the nature of their record, uh, and then it will tell them whether or not they are likely or unlikely to be able to expunge their record. Uh, for the automated version, uh, these are a little bit more uh, technically complex, but the idea is, is that someone can put in their case number Basically, an expungement algorithm will run through a database of case records and then we'll tell the person whether or not they can expunge or not, and then we'll move uh, the person's information to a form uh, that auto populates it and then can go be filed either pro se or by an attorney. Um, and then, as we already talked a little bit about these tools, they can be used for referrals, they can be used to determine eligibility or to, to the complete the forms themselves. Um, what we're seeing is one of the things that's somewhat new is there's been a lot of legal aid advocacy on the side, but most recently the San Francisco District Attorney's Office decided to use an automated approach to expungement for marijuana convictions going back to the 1970s. And they've used that automated approach to create basically mass petitions of hundreds of expungements all at once in front of a 
court, which is an interesting evolution in the technology. But before they can get there, they need to assess uh, basics of uh, an expungement uh, technology. Uh, first, and this might seem obvious, is you need to understand whether or not the people you're trying to connect with have internet access. That might seem uh, silly in this day and age, but a project that I worked on in Mississippi was web-based. We built it, everything worked fine, and then our partners asked us what they were supposed to do in the more rural counties in their state to not have uh, internet access and limited uh, data for their phones, and so we had to make a remote version of it. But it's important to consider what connectivity looks like. Secondly, the jurisdiction that you're operating in has to have an expungement statute with objective factors. Uh, things like good person tests, uh, lar statutes that allow for large judicial discretion, uh, as well as character witness requirements, all disfavor building a technical tr tool uh, to deal with expungement because you, the more effective tools rely on those objective uh, factors that you'll find in the statute. Uh, next is a capacity. It's one thing to build the tool. It's another thing to keep it up and going. And so kind of in the same way that uh, ABA model rule 1.1 uh, requires uh, competence. Uh, if you look through the comment section, you've got to keep up on the laws that you are practicing, which is uh, a no-brainer for all the attorneys that are listening. But the same is going to be true of the technology that's meant to reflect some aspect of the legal system. And those tools are going to have to be updated as statutes change or processes change. And then last, and this is always uh, a struggle for many people, is funding, uh, keeping a coder on to be able to make those changes into the future unless your office has that internal capacity is always something that needs to be considered from the beginning to make sure that there's longevity. And then last, as you'll hear more specifically from Matthew and Michael, is that uh, for, for the more automated projects, you need a usable data set of criminal records to be able to automate the process. Uh, and this is hard. The types of databases that Matthew and Michael are able to use in Maryland and Pennsylvania, respectively, uh, are only, only exist in a minority of states around the country. Um, and then even states that do have publicly accessible criminal records databases might not be updated often. They might have accuracy issues and other uh, hurdles that can confound the development of these types of tools. Um, but I will leave uh, the specifics uh, to them uh, to talk about uh, the, the struggles, trials, and tribulations of, of this type of work. Perfect. Thank you, Jason. Uh, so uh, I'm Matthew Stubenberg here at the Harvard Access Justice Lab. Uh, and before that, I built the MD expungement website, which automated expungements in Maryland. And so what made it so great in Maryland is we had kind of three critical things go right with our statewide case search website. So Maryland has a case search lookup website that is statewide, it's not county by county. Uh, it's free to use. There's no bot blocker like a CAPTCHA or, you know, click all the images of the sign in order to continue. And the final piece that really made it work is it included all the relevant information that we needed for expungement. This is kind of a crucial piece. If you have a great website that, it, that the courts run, but it doesn't include the verdict or the disposition, and that's what's needed to determine expungement, that's kind of a, a crux of the whole, the whole plan. Uh, and I will just kind of state here that while in Maryland we were lucky that it was free and there was no bot blocker or anything like that, those two can be overcome. Uh, you know, if you, if you get the court's permission, uh, sometimes you can bypass some of these other uh, things that are normally designed to block uh, other nefarious actors. Uh, and so there are ways around that uh, with the right, um, kind of the right access and the right partnerships with the court. Uh, and uh, like Jason explained, expungement law in Maryland was very objective. Uh, it's a very straightforward yes or no test uh, in 99% of cases. So Maryland was a great state that it worked for uh, very well. So how mdexpungement.com works is in uh, Maryland, you can look up a case either by someone's name or by the case number itself. And that's just through the court's website that I just talked about. So how we design MD expungement is we presume that people came to the website knowing their case number or the ability to find their case number. And they would input their case number into MD expungement. 
which would then use a web scraper to pull out the HTML of the, uh, the, the cases page from Maryland's case search website. So it's very similar to in, uh, somebody typing in a case number on the court's website and all the information being presented. We just automated that process so it all happened in the background electronically. We would get the information for that person's page. We'd get rid of all the stuff that wasn't relevant just uh, until we just had the leftover variables or relevant facts needed to make the determination and fill out the forms. Once we had the uh, required kind of uh, variables or facts needed to determine whether or not a case was eligible for expungement, we built a simple algorithm that basically plugged it all in and very quickly could determine whether or not this case was eligible for expungement. Uh, and uh, once you kind of had that determination made, it was a fairly straightforward process to then fill out the court provided expungement petition form uh, and just to populate that and, and have it be printed out. Now, unfortunately in Maryland, uh, this type of petition still requires an actual ink on uh, paper signature in order to file. So we couldn't modify that last piece to also have it filed electronically. Uh, it's just a, one of the limitations that, that Maryland kind of had in place. And it's one of the limitations in general of local court rules that sometimes need to be changed to take it to the next step. Uh, the website has been hugely successful. Uh, we've actually sponged over 65,000 cases since the website uh, was launched in 2015. So we built this website in 2015 and quickly realized that we needed a faster way of expunging these records. It currently, or at the time it was, you typed in one case number and that would uh, you know, bring up that person's one criminal case, tell you if it's eligible and print the form. Well, if you sit down with someone who has 15 cases eligible for expungement, you very quickly realize that you need to have a, a faster way of doing this. And so the first method that we did to expand this was we had a way where you could just type in all of the client's case numbers all at once. So you would look up their name on Maryland's court website uh, you find there are 10 eligible cases. This is primarily used for attorneys who could very quickly identify the cases they wanted to expunge. And then they would just type in the 15 case numbers and that would give them all of the forms they need to file in one fail swoop. We also took it a step further, which uh, I kind of wish we had done from the beginning, which uh, made it a lot easier to use, is we built a Chrome extension that actually operated on the court's website itself. Uh, and if you're not too familiar with the Chrome extension, it basically adds functionality to the Chrome browser. All the browsers have their own extensions. We built one for Chrome. And when you're on the court's website looking up criminal records, it adds a little button to your browser. And you can actually click on that button, and it will uh, kind of scrape all the information that you're currently looking at, send it back to our servers, and we'll return the results saying, yes, this is likely expungeable. Uh, you know, would you like to expunge it? And so it allows the user to actually remain on the court's website expunging cases as you go along instead of having to learn a new interface and switch back and forth between the two sites. Uh, and that, that has proven very uh, successful at speeding up the whole process, especially with attorneys who uh, are very familiar with the court's website, you know, just in their general practice, but might not want to learn a whole new interface and, and what MD expungement is. So what I've explained so far is about how 99% of people use the website. Uh, we were, however, able to kind of extend it uh, a bit as well. So we realized that by typing in, you know, a, a person would come to the website, type in their case number, and it would pull their information for that one case and we'd analyze it. Well, we realized, well, what if we could uh, kind of understand the way that case numbers are generated in general in Maryland? And then could we just automate that process as well? Could we start from the first case number and just feed in each subsequent case number until we basically analyzed every uh, criminal case in Maryland? So that's what we did, and we were able to save all of the criminal cases uh, in, into a big database that we now control. And once we have this database, it allows us to search uh, by much more specific fields that the court's website does not. So in Maryland, the course website only lets you look up uh, by somebody's first and last name, and then usually you can narrow it down by county. 
Uh, once you have the full database, you can search by almost anything that's available. And so we can search by name and date of birth. We can search by uh, particular charges. Uh, we can search by various spellings of someone's name uh, much more quickly. Uh, and so this allowed us to uh, really expand on the search functionality. And once it's in a big database that you control, we are actually able to uh, tie it in with other pieces of software that we ran. So uh, we created an API, which is a, an application program interface, which means that uh, other programs can connect to this database in a very technical way without a human intervention. And so using our case management system, legal server, we were able to tie in the ability so whenever a new case was generated, it would automatically ping this database with the client's information to see if they have any criminal cases or any civil cases. We scraped all the civil ones up as well. And automatically bring that information back to the case management system, uh, which is a really uh, kind of interesting way to find out a lot more about your client without actually adding any staff overtime uh, or, or additional costs once it's built. And interestingly, once we had all this information, we realized that we could make some really cool policy points that weren't otherwise available or even possible. So one thing we did is we ran all of these criminal cases that we had just collected. We ran them all through the expungement algorithm. And so we were actually able to tell for the first time exactly how many cases in Maryland were eligible for expungement uh, at that exact moment. And we could break it down by county and uh, even neighborhood. And what we were able to do is, uh, for whatever reason, the Maryland's court website has the defendant's home address as one of the fields that's on their website when you look up their, their criminal case. We were able to geocode all of those defendant's addresses, which allowed us to actually create an interactive map where we could zoom in on different neighborhoods and determine exactly how many people in this neighborhood have a case eligible for expungement. Uh, and this, this way you can really target either when you're trying to make a policy point that look, you know, this neighborhood uh, you know, needs a lot of help and here's exactly why. Uh, it can make policy points for people who are trying to push legislation. Uh, and then even when you're trying to direct your own resource, right? Maybe you only have enough uh, resources for one or two expungement clinics a year. Well, where are you going to put those expungement clinics? Well, now you can actually target them to where they'll have the most good. And one interesting thing we did is uh, we held uh, an expungement clinic and we actually were able to mail letters to the closest people to that expungement clinic saying, hey, uh, you have a case, one, two, three, four, five, that is eligible for expungement. Why don't you come down to the uh, you know, we did this in Anne Arundel County, the Anne Arundel County Public Library, where we will help you for free expunge your criminal record. Uh, and I, I'm sure it would have worked fantastically had a snowstorm not had to cancel that clinic. But the potential is still there uh, to do a lot of really interesting outreach that, that wasn't quite possible before. So when it comes to uh, lessons learned, we we definitely started in one area and, and have made several modifications throughout the entire process. So originally, we designed MD expungement for pro se use. This was a way for somebody to expunge their own record without using an attorney uh, and without having to, to you know, learn too much about expungement law. However, almost overnight, uh, the biggest user of the website was attorneys who were just trying to speed up the the process. And so that meant that we had to make a lot of changes to the format of the website uh, in order to kind of make it more adapt to our, our current clientele who are attorneys. Uh, this meant removing a lot of the uh, language that uh, kind of a lot of the warning language and stuff like that that attorneys already knew and after seeing after the first or second time they weren't really interested in seeing for the next 500 times as well. Um, and then, uh, as I discussed before, we had to make it so you could expunge cases much faster. If you're a pro se client, you're probably fine taking your time expunging your five to ten cases to make sure you get it all right. When you're an attorney who's uh, looking to expunge, you know, 10 to 20 cases per client and you have 50 clients waiting for expungement, uh, you need to speed that up and after the first couple, you usually get the, how the process works. Uh, 
One thing that we uh, didn't quite anticipate, although we probably should have in retrospect, is just how quickly expungement law changes in Maryland, uh, and as I suspect in many other states uh, nationwide. So in Maryland, the expungement law has changed every year uh, for the last four years, and sometimes even shorter than that. So we've had law changes that would take effect at the six-month mark. Uh, this has required changes in algorithm, changes in uh, how things were scraped out, uh, that uh, generally some, uh, would need to be done with just, you know, a month or two head notice. So that's not always enough time to go find, you know, a grant to get it funded or something like that. Uh, the courts, once they started getting inundated with all these different petitions, started changing how they would normally affect or process expungement. And they would sometimes change in a court-specific way and in a way that wasn't readily apparent. Uh, you know, it was, uh, what generally would happen before, now all of a sudden wouldn't happen. And the only way to know that is you'd hear from an attorney that they have a new procedure in place and here's how they would like to have it done now. And so uh, we needed to rebuild parts of the system to be much more flexible in terms of what the courts were currently, how they were processing these expungement petitions. Uh, the forms themselves actually changed as well. And so we needed to, uh, almost overnight one day, uh, change uh, which forms were being populated uh, and what information was being placed where. And then as with everything, there's always bugs that you discover, right, especially when you're processing thousands and thousands of petitions uh, using web scrapers, which is kind of inherently always a uh, continuing editing process. Uh, there's always changes that need to be made. So if you are considering creating a website similar to MD Expungement, I would highly recommend uh, budgeting enough resources to be able to make changes quickly uh, and on the fly if need be. Uh, this was something that uh, I, w I wish we had kind of really focused in on, on the front end. That this is not a project that once it's created, it's done and you can walk away from it. It's, it's very much a, a constant labor of love. Uh, and the last piece is uh, I built this right out of law school. Uh, I didn't have any uh, backing or anything, and so I was a little worried about you know, unauthorized practice of law, especially for pro se users using this without any attorney overview. And so if that is one of the routes you plan to go, I highly recommend putting lots of disclaimers. Uh, the law around unauthorized practice uh, of law is very vague in a lot of states. Whether or not this constitutes it is vague. I, I clearly think I'm on the right side of the law, but I made sure to put up lots of disclaimers so that uh, pro se users who were using the website uh, were clear that this was not, uh, you know, operate, there was no attorney on the back end who was reviewing everything before it came to them. That this was an algorithm and it was meant just as a, a tool to help you, but ultimately you're responsible for the, the outcome of this expungement case. So, uh, you know, lawyers love disclaimers. This is not a time when I would uh, get rid of that love. Uh, so thanks so much. I'm going to pass it on uh, to Michael Hollander. Great. Thank you, Matt. And uh, I should say thank you for anticipating basically everything that I wanted to talk about. Uh, <laughs> Matt and I, uh, pretty impressively, I think, and, and sort of coincidentally, Matt and I um, developed Expungent Generator as not knowing about the other person's tool, uh, and they developed for a long time in parallel to each other without us really talking to each other. And they, they, they did different things in the end. You know, Matt's operate differently than the one in Pennsylvania does. Um, but many things we did the same, and many of the sort of updates and changes and lessons learned between Matt and I are exactly the same. So uh, it's it's always fun to talk on a panel with Matt because we, we really worked in parallel doing something very similar. Um, I'm going to try to not duplicate too much of the content that Matt did since we do have a lot of similarities. What I'll say is that um, in 2011, uh, I created an expungement generator in Pennsylvania. Um, we had a lot of the same types of factors that Matt mentioned. We have a unified court website for the entire state that lists everybody's record. It's free to use. There's nothing like a CAPTCHA on there, although there are some complications with using the website um, with a computer that make it a little bit harder, maybe I think, than Maryland's is in terms of looking up cases. Um, but we did, and we also have a, a, a law that is very straightforward and objective. It's very easy for the vast majority of people to look at a case or a series of cases and decide what is 
um, eligible for expungement or sealing and what is not. Um, and so what that allowed me to do is create a, a, a product that I call the expungement generator uh, that we've now spread to be used throughout Pennsylvania. So we're just one program in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, and there's probably 25 or so programs around the state that are using the expungement generator in some form or another. Even uh, several other organizations in Philadelphia use it um, because we don't do all the expungement services in Philadelphia. Um, the, the um, technology behind it's probably very is very similar to Mass. Uh, there's a what I call it what's what's called technically a headless browser. So uh, there's actually a like a almost like a an instance of Chrome or a web browser running on a server somewhere. And when you go to my expungement website or the expungement generator website and you type in someone's name and date of birth in the background, that computer is actually going off to the court's website as if they was a normal person clicking on the right boxes, typing in a person's name, and then getting back a result. And then just like Matt says, it scrapes all of the information from that website. So it sees that person has six cases, it finds those cases, downloads them, returns all the information back so a user can see those cases, and then it ultimately runs each case through an algorithm that takes out the relevant information, the case number, each charge that's on the person's record, the dispositions of those charges, the date of the arrest, things like that, and determines what cases are eligible and not eligible for expungement. And then finally, it generates word editable petition. Um, and Matt didn't say this, although I presume this is true in Maryland as well. The, the benefit of this is twofold, or it's, there's probably four or five benefits I could talk about, but one of which is that uh, the expungement program does a much better job than a human. Uh, so for the most part, uh, you know, when a, when a person, a lawyer or a paralegal or somebody goes through and does an expungement, they're generally going to get it right. Um, but they don't always get it right. They make mistakes. They transpose a number incorrectly from a docket sheet onto an expungement petition. They type somebody's name incorrectly. And so before we had an expungement program, it wasn't uncommon for us to go to court and, you know, some 10% or something of the petitions we filed would be rejected, not because the person wasn't eligible for expungement, but because there was some technical error on the form. And we would have to go back to our office, redo the forms, print them out, and bring them back to court. The expungement generator makes far fewer errors. It's not to say that it's perfect, it makes errors as well, but the types of errors it makes are easier for a human to catch, and they don't have to do with things like transposing numbers or typing someone's name wrong. So that's a huge benefit. Um, that also allows us to um, use people who aren't as familiar with expungement laws to help us with our expungement. So volunteer lawyers, law students, paralegals, people who might not be trained in expungement law can now come and help us do expungement clinics without very much training. We can give them more basic training on how to use the tool and general training on how to read a criminal record, but we don't have to give them all of the technical information they need to be able to make assessments about expungement. The other major benefit of the tool is that it, in Pennsylvania, it would take on the order of 20 to 40 minutes for somebody to, to create one expungement petition for one defendant. And a defendant could have three, five, 10, or 20 petitions that need to be generated for each person. So you can imagine that, that can take, you know, for anywhere from an hour to eight to 10 hours to generate all the petitions for one person, depending on how many they have, which is not only extremely time consuming, but for the person doing it, it can be very boring. Um, and with the expungement generator, and I'm assuming with MD expungement, that process is cut down to a minute, two minutes, three minutes, um, even if the person has 20 petitions that have to be generated. So there's a huge time savings on top of the accuracy issue. Um, I, since 2011, we've generated something like 45,000 petitions statewide. Um, that number is increasing by uh, probably about 10,000 petitions a year. Um, maybe a bit more, so that's just increasingly going up. Let me see how I change slides here. So I'm not going to go through too much, but you can sort of see the steps of the expungement generator here just to show you that there's automated steps that you go through, and at the very end, what you end up with is what's on the very right-hand side, which is um, an actual expungement petition that is written uh, in Word format, so you can open it and edit it to the extent that it needs to be edited in the future. Um, I want to focus on a few aspects that Matt didn't focus as much on that I think make both his and uh, the expungement generators uh, programs really, really great for doing expungements. And obviously the most, the, the greatest benefit of these 
is that they generate expungement themselves, right? The time savings is enormous. Um, the accuracy is enormous. That's all really helpful. But there's additional things that we have both done over time, um, and we did independently of each other, but I think really make these tools far more valuable than just generating petitions. So the first is I want to talk about the databases that underlie these, and the second is the, um, the APIs that allow external tools to talk to the expungement generator. So databases, as hopefully most of you know, are just a way to store lots of information about people in a structured way. So you can store all of the cases that get run through your expungement program in one place. You can store all your defendants in another place and you can connect them together in some way. You might be able to store all the charges that people get charged with in another place and again, connect that to all the cases and all the expungements. The beauty of having a database is that when you're preparing petitions by hand or even when you have an expungement program that's not storing everything, every person whose petition is generated, there's all this information that you learn about that person, about their record, about what that individual case was, what's on their record, the dispositions, the dates of those dispositions, their age when things happen. And then all that information is lost the second you're done preparing that person's petition because you've forgotten it because you can't keep track of every client that you have and so on. When you have a program that is reading everyone's dockets and then storing that information internally, you suddenly have this wealth of information that you can do all the things that Matt talked about. Instead of just being able to query somebody's record in the way that you were before, going and typing their name and maybe date of birth or case number, you can now do all sorts of things. You can find everybody who was arrested in a certain zip code. Um, you can figure out what percentage of cases are expungible in a given area or in a state. Um, you, can, you can find clients who are eligible for some certain type of expungement um, that may be new because the law has changed, and when you dealt with them previously, that law wasn't there, and so you didn't do an expungement of a certain case that you can now do. There's all sorts of things that you can look at once you have a database. There's just three sort of main things that I think about is internal issues that you might want to think about with a database. How are we doing? How many expungements are we doing per day, per week, per year compared to last year or the year before? Um, are we reaching the right people? So Matt showed that great map of all of the arrests that are expungible in Maryland. Well, are you actually doing expungements in those neighborhoods that have a high number of expungible arrests? If you're a program like CLS, which at the time when I first did this analysis was a walk-in only program, right? People would come to us and say, I have an expungement. I looked and it turns out that there were high arrest areas of the city that had lots of expungible cases and we just weren't seeing that many people from those areas, even though we know that they're eligible. So then we could go out and we could design clinics where we would go into neighborhoods that we knew had high arrest rates that we weren't previously meeting. Um, and so that, was, that enabled us to internally decide if we were doing a good job. Obviously for funders, having data is literally of gold, right? You can. Um, figure out how many expungements you filed over a certain period of time, how many records were fully cleared. You can multiply that out by the value of what maybe a private lawyer would charge for the same types of services and say the value of the services that your office is providing. You can provide all sorts of great information for funders, for grant applications, um, for media, for other things that might promote your organization and the work that you're doing. Um, that's very hard to do, at least on this scale, if you don't have a database. Um, and then the last thing is, and Matt talked about this, is you could start asking some really interesting questions that helps you with lobbying. So, you know, first when you go in to talk to legislators, you want to be able to show that you have some reason to be in front of them. So if you can say we have performed X number of expungements in this time period, it really gives you those bona fides that you might need to have that conversation. Um, you know, the second is you can go in and say, you know, what's the state of the world? Why do we need this law that we are pushing for, this change in expungement? And people don't often know what the actual state of the world is from a statistical standpoint, right? They don't know how many cases are out there for misdemeanor drug convictions that are over a certain number of years old. Well, now you can answer that question for them and tell them what the size, what the scale of the problem is. Uh, that's a really great addition to having individuals that you can walk in and say, here are the stories of people that will be affected by this change of law. And that's what we're all really good at in legal services is finding those individuals. Well, this also helps you find those individuals, right? If you have a database where you can say, okay, who are all of our clients? What do their records look like? 
then you can also go back and say, okay, I need to find a client who has a felony drug conviction that's at least 10 years old and that's the only thing on their record because that's gonna be a great candidate to bring in front of the legislature to show them why this new law is important or to put in front of the media to tell that person's life story. So you can go back and you can mine your own database to make sure that you understand uh, what, what types of people would be good to bring to legislators. So databases are this amazing tool and I highly recommend that anyone who's sort of thinking about any legal tech tool thinks about having a database and storing information about what they're doing in the background. Um, go to the next slide, I'm not good with WebEx, I apologize. The other thing that I wanna talk about is um, APIs and Matt talked about APIs a little bit. I wanna go a little bit more in depth into it. So an API, like Matt said, is a way for computers to talk to each other. And the simplest example I think that you can think of in your daily life is if you ever have, if you have an iPhone or an Android phone and you open up a weather app, the weather app doesn't know the weather everywhere. The weather app knows where you are and then it sends out a request to the National Weather Service or somebody like that and says, please tell me what the weather forecast is for this neighborhood in the next five days. And the National Weather Forecast or Service sends back all that information and then the weather app displays it for you and makes it look pretty. So that uses an API. Your app talks to the National Weather Service using an API and they can communicate back and forth doing that. Well, Matt and I have both put APIs on our expungement tools. The expungement generator has one and exp uh, MD expungement has one. And what that allows us to do is have third party programs talk to our expungement tool so that you can further abstract the user from having to go and sit in the criminal records website. So Matt said that 99% of his users are still going to the criminal records website. I hope that as his API catches on, people will stop going to the criminal records website. And the vision that I have um, is that we're actually just gonna be able to sit in our case management system and our case management system will be able to do all the work for us. Um, so. A long time ago, maybe four, four years ago, I came up with a very crude integration between our expungement tool and our case management system. And that's that after you use the expungement tool and you find all of a person's information about what's expungible, you could type a case number in for a person and it will email all of the information from the expungement tool into our case management system. So a case note that's created from an email. Now this is great, it helps. Um, we were electronically storing information about our clients, but there were problems with it. One is people had to remember to, that the best practice was once you got all your expungement information prepared, that you would email it into our case management tool. You had to just remember to even use it. And then second is you have to type the case number correctly. And the case number like yours are like ours is just a series of like seven random numbers. And so it was common that people would mistype case numbers. And so they would think that they were sending an email to the case tool, the case management tool, but they weren't. Um, and this, this next slide is basically um, what that crude integration looked like. So you'd go to your client management system, you'd find a client, then you'd go into the expungement tool, you'd search for that person and generate expungements, and then you would click some buttons and an email would be sent from one tool to the other. But then I want to create a tighter integration, and that's what an API is. So the tighter integration works like this. You go to your case management system and you type your, you pull your client's information up. And then instead of having to go out and change browser windows and type all the same information in again to the expungement tool, you can actually click a button on your case management system and say, prepare all the expungements for this person. And in the background, the case management system, which community legal service happens to use legal server, although this should be possible with other ones, but legal server sends information off to the expungement generator. It sends off things like the username of the person who's using the case management system so that it can be logged in and petitions can be generated with the right person's name on them. It sends in your client's first name, last name, address, social security number, things like that. And then the expungement generator just runs on its own, finds all the expungible cases, downloads them, does the expungement and then sends back that information to legal server so that the legal server has a case note and it's updated with a person's information a couple minutes later. And all the user had to do was go to uh, the case management system and click a button. So that's the tighter integration. And what we wanna move into is something that's even tighter. And I think Matt was alluding to this as well in Maryland, which is that you don't even need to click a button anymore. If somebody comes in for intake to community legal services, 
and they give us their name, their social security number, and their date of birth. And it doesn't matter if they came in for an expungement issue, a housing issue, um, a foreclosure issue, a tax issue, a welfare issue, whatever the issue is, while we're going through the rest of the intake with them, in the background, legal server can send that request off using the API to the expungement tool. The expungement tool can do its thing, and then it can send the information back to the case so that by the time the intake is done, the intake paralegal will finish the intake, they'll get to the landing page for that client, and they'll say, oh, okay, well, I know you came here for a welfare issue, but I see that you also have a couple of things on your criminal record that are expungible. Would you like me to put a case in for you about expungement services as well? Is that something that you're interested in? So this is really what I think the future of how we do intake in all of our programs is going to be. Um, and this is, doesn't just have to be for expungement and criminal records tools, but that's what we're talking about today. But there's no reason why this couldn't happen for foreclosure cases, landlord-tenant cases, um, whatever other public benefits you might be able to screen for and have some external tool for. <laughs> that by the time somebody goes through intake, they've actually been screened for lots of different things, even if those aren't the issues that they originally came in for. So that we as lawyers, as advocates, can have a more holistic view of our clients and a more holistic view of the types of problems they have and the ones that might be worth solving. Um, so one of the things that I think, one of the problems that I have when we give these talks is that Matt and I, have now talked to you and shown you these really neat tools that do a lot of different things. They have databases, APIs, Matt has a Chrome extension, they automatically do all this work for you, there's algorithms backing them, there's all this great stuff. And people see this and they're really excited about it and they say, how can I do this in my state? And it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I've had maybe 10 or 15 conversations over the last few years with people who are interested in replicating this work in their state, and I don't think any of those has led to somebody actually doing this work in their state. And it's not because they can't. I think part of the problem is that when we show you these things, what we're showing you is a completed tool. It's a very complicated tool. It's sort of like a Swiss Army knife. You might have started off with one thing that you wanted, which was a knife, um, but then you ended up having all these other side tools that ended up being really useful, um, and so you, you put them all together. And when you work on a project, you really can't work on the all at once or the, the all in one tool from the beginning. You need to start thinking about, you can think about where is the end point that I wanna be. And Matt, I think was very astute in saying that, look, there's gonna be lots of changes over time, both in the law and the way the program should run. And you need to plan for that from day one. But at the same time, you don't have to build that ultimate tool from day one. You should be thinking about what is that minimum tool that would be really useful, right? So don't start with this most complicated thing. Start with a minimum tool that might be useful and then iterate on that. Keep making it more useful and more useful and more useful. So the minimum tool that I made, and Matt showed you some of his iterations, all it did was you had to go yourself to the court website, search for a person's name, download all of their docket sheets, and then go to my tool and upload those docket sheets and it would analyze them and create petitions for you. It was a great first step. It automatically generated petitions, but there were a lot of manual steps involved. And then over time, I added in all these extra pieces, right? I added a database on. I added the ability for it to automatically search the court website for you. I added on this API. I added on other things. Um, so all of these other things came as time went on and as we needed them. Um, I think one of the problems would be if you start from the beginning and say, what's the all-in-one tool I can make? When you finish the all-in-one tool, you probably aren't gonna use 80% of the features you created because you've just thought of them in your head. You haven't actually asked users what they want and what they need. So I would recommend for anyone who's thinking about making one of these tools to start thinking about what's the minimum tool that's gonna be really helpful um, and work on that. And don't put a lot of time into it. Put a small amount of time into a small project, see if it's useful, and if it is, then put a small amount of time into the next piece and the next piece and the next piece. And if there's pieces that don't pan out, we'll abandon them. You haven't spent that much time on them and you shouldn't bother continuing to work on them and start working on the next piece that might be really useful. So for a state, for example, like Matt was, or like Jason was talking about earlier, that maybe doesn't have electronic records, well, there might be a minimum tool that's good for you. Maybe you have to go to the courthouse and scan through all of the paper records and look at them and figure out what's expungible and pull things out of those paper records by hand. <laughs> well, maybe the minimum tool in that state 
would be to write a program that could uh, allow you to scan all of those paper dockets and do something useful with them, like just digitize them. So maybe just digitizing them is step one, and that would be useful to attorneys and paralegals because that saves a step for them. And then maybe step two would be pulling out the criminal convictions and non-convictions from those cases, all the charges and dispositions. And then maybe step three would be something beyond that, like actually generating petitions. But each of those steps along the way probably has some value. So the last thing that I want to talk about before um, I end my section is the next iteration of all of this, which is automating at a state level. And I'm not going to talk about this a lot because this is more about technology than clean slate legislation. Um, but I think that this really, if you start making expungement generation tools like Matt did and like I did, the next thing you start thinking is, why are we doing this? If the state has a database and it's possible to figure out from the state's database what all the expungible cases are, well, why are we wasting all of our time generating filing petitions, going to court, arguing for expungement, waiting for things to be sent around to different agencies. It's a big waste of time. And if you can get people on board, and that's not always easy, but if you can get legislators on board to convince them that, you know, 99% of expungement petitions are granted in my state. We're filing thousands of these a year. They're all granted, but they take five to six hours worth of court time just to process them because someone has to accept the filing, somebody has to send it up to the judge, it has to be prepared, there has to be a hearing, judge has to sign it, it has to be mailed to different agencies and so on. If you can convince people that that's a waste of time and money and that there's beneficial reentry goals or other types of criminal justice reform goals, then maybe you can convince them that the state should be automating their own record clearance. Um, and this is just what we did in Pennsylvania. We did convince the state to do automated record clearance. Um, so they're starting, in December, um, we're, we have an expanded statute, but starting in 2019 or 2020, it's a little bit unclear. Um, the state's actually going to start expunging records on its own if they meet some minimum criteria. So the positives, obviously, is that the state is doing this for us. There's a huge increase in volume. There's a huge cost savings to the state as well as to petitioners who don't have to go and do this, and where you're filling some sort of a justice gap, right? There's, there's lots and lots of people, 80, 90% of people in Pennsylvania who have a record have some charges that are expungible, um, but they're not actually going and getting them expunged. So this fills in that gap by doing it for them. Um, on the negative side, you know, automated expungement is not going to be everything. Once you get into the process of automating things, people say, hmm, why would I automate, you know, getting a like a murder conviction or a murder um, charge off somebody's record. Maybe I don't want to have murder come off of somebody's record without having a hearing in front of a judge, right? So you start to get all these people who start asking questions to say, well, I don't feel comfortable with felonies coming off of somebody's record, or I want to wait 10 years before something comes off of someone's record. And so the product that you end up with when you're automating expungement, especially of convictions, is the minimum product that everyone can agree on, right? So it's the minimum things that can come off that everyone agrees, look, if you have a misdemeanor retail theft conviction, it's the only thing on your record and it's 15 years old, sure, that should be able to come off. Okay, well, that gets included, included in clean slate. But the downside is you're not going to get to all of the things that should be expungible or should be sealable or maybe that we're all filing and petitioning to be sealable. So it gets you a lot of the way there and it closes a gap that existed. Um, but it doesn't get you all of the way there, and there still needs to be a lot of manual work that's going to happen on top of automatic expungements. Um, so that's all I have to say, Alex. I'm passing this back to you for any questions, but I appreciate you giving us the time to talk about this. Thank you, Michael. Uh, just a reminder to all of our attendees, you can uh, type any questions you have for any of our presenters into the Q&A box on your screen. I'll uh, go ahead with questions we've got already. This one could go to uh, either uh, Michael or, or Matthew, I believe. And um, it is, who are the attorneys using these applications? Is it free legal service providers, public defenders, private attorneys? Uh, who is it who's actually using this uh, among lawyers? Yeah, sure. So I, uh, this is Matthew. I can speak to that first. Uh, so we have a pretty wide range of people using the tool. I think the biggest 
uh, category, the biggest user, is the legal aid public defender pro bono attorney user. Uh, I think that represents the vast majority, but we do have private attorneys who use it for their own client, uh, unrelated to anything nonprofit or legal aid. And in Pennsylvania, the vast majority of users are nonprofit legal aid providers. Um, a couple of public defender programs in Pennsylvania use it. Uh, there's some law school clinics using it. Sometimes there'll be a, a clinic that pops up, maybe through the Barristers Association or something that we'll provide to them. We have not yet provided to private attorneys who are providing, uh, providing commercial services for expungement where they're charging clients. Um, we've sort of struggled with that and we've thought about charging attorneys for doing that, but we've never actually worked out a model where somebody is interested in paying us for um, using the expungement software and then charging their clients for the, the work. But that seems like a fruitful avenue for the future. We just haven't figured out a way to actually do it without turning me, who is a lawyer and does a lot of other work besides the expungement generator from being just a customer service person for all these people that are buying the service from us. Next question is um, about your background, um, and the questioner would like to know, how did you learn to create these programs? Do you want to start with that one, Michael? Sure. Uh, so I before, I, before I went to law school, I was a programmer. Um, I, I worked at a software company in San Francisco for a few years, and then I went back to law school. So programming, to some extent, is built into my DNA as a lawyer. Um, and I've done a number of different tech projects over time. So this was one that made a lot of sense for me from the standpoint of I was doing expungement as a lawyer on a daily basis and experienced the, the, the pain points of doing expungement and saw the opportunity for automating it because of all the things that Jason brought up, up front about um, having an available data set and uh, straightforward expungement on things like that. And I actually came at it from a, a different way. Uh, I took coding in high school, but I was a political science undergrad and not really a tech focus in law school. After law school, as I was trying to figure out what to do with this new expensive law degree, I had some time off and so I built uh, a mobile app, just kind of trying to draw on my old programming knowledge and some, you know, some books and some YouTube tutorials just to build an app to kind of boost my resume and build something useful for law clerks. And after I built that, I, I realized just what, how big the potential was in the legal tech arena. So I kind of doubled down on that. But for anybody who's a, you know, a law student or, or a lawyer looking to kind of become a coder, it is completely possible for somebody to become a very good programmer without having gone to college and gotten a degree and spent you know, the first 20 years of their life um, coding nonstop. Next uh, question is uh, probably uh, something that you anticipated, and that is, which states have record systems that are ready for automated sealing? Jason, you might have the best answer of all of us. I don't know if that's true. I don't think my answer is up to date. The last time I looked at this was a few years ago. Uh, for the report I mentioned earlier. And I think at that time we were saying about 18 uh, states had some version of a public criminal record database uh, that was accessible, uh, and we did not dive deep enough to know the uh, accuracy and quality of those databases. Uh, I think that's one of those things you're only going to know once you begin to build the project and realize uh, that there's going to be a bunch of limitations that you didn't. Uh, anticipate, but it is a minority of states. And one of the other, actually to add on to that, and this is some work that's been done more recently, is that uh, only a minority of states, and this doesn't correlate with whether or not they have a, a public records database, actually have um, identifying numbers that track people throughout the criminal justice system, um, which, which can complicate uh, the data poll, depending on what system stakeholder you're getting the data from in Maryland and in Pennsylvania, they both were able to use the court's data system, 
uh, but it might be corrections, it might be the DA's office, it might be the public defender's office that has uh, the better data set, but then there's no guarantee that the unique identifier of a case number is actually tracking someone through all of those different bureaucracies. So that's another data headache that, that we didn't mention earlier, but may come up depending on um, the state's uh, situation. But it is, it is worth saying, Jason mentioned earlier that the San Francisco District Attorney's Office is working right now on this project to do automated expungements of old marijuana convictions. And that does raise this question of, um, there, there are maybe only 18 states where there's public access to these statewide criminal records, but there may be other states where there are criminal record databases that only maybe, say, law enforcement or the courts have access to. And it's possible in this day and age that maybe you can go through a friendly DA's office and work on some of this and get some of the data through a DA's office or actually have the DA's office doing the work of helping to generate the petitions. Um, there's a number of progressive district attorneys around the state, or around the country rather, who are, um, I think, interested in this kind of work. And I will say that uh, expungement law uh, and especially kind of court technology is both moving really fast. So if today your state isn't perfectly situated for an automated expungement website like Maryland or Pennsylvania, um, it, you know, in six months or a year, there could be that, that blockage is removed, some law is passed, some court data is now online. And so it's always worth it to just keep abreast a of how uh, the courts and the expungement law is changing and might overcome that block. We are now at time. So we extend our thanks to today's presenters. If anyone has additional questions, you may email the presenters directly or email cleanslate at csgjusticecenter.org. We encourage you to sign up for our newsletter at cleanslateclearinghouse.org to receive information on future webinars and other announcements. We also encourage you to spread the word about the Clean Slate Clearinghouse in your networks. Thank you for joining the webinar today.